<laughs> well, uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to uh, tonight's British Academy uh, lecture. Uh, my name is Lindsay Farmer, and I'm a professor here at the University of Glasgow. I'm also vice president of the British Academy. And it's a great pleasure to welcome you here on this beautifully sunny evening. I'm very impressed that so many people have turned out, given the the, uh, the temptations of the Glasgow uh, weather. The lecture tonight is a partnership between the, the British Academy uh, and the Royal Philosophical Society. Uh, and it, it's, it's wonderful that we can uh, partner in this way to uh, organize the, the lectures. The British Academy, for those of you who don't know, is the UK's National Academy of the Humanities and Social Sciences, and it mobilizes these disciplines to understand the world and to help shape the future. The British Academy is an independent fellowship of world-leading uh, scholars, a funding body for research, and a forum for debate. As such, our lectures program, curated by our fellowship, aims to stimulate discussion and debate. The British Academy lecture series reflects a wonderfully broad breadth of our subjects and academic perspect perspectives within them. And I'm very much looking forward tonight to hearing the lecture from Lord Bew. But to introduce Lord Bew, uh, Pat Monahan from the Royal Philosophical Society. Quite hot in here. Um, I hope you can all hear me. Okay, great. Um, well, as you know, this lecture was postponed uh, from March, so it's a great pleasure uh, that Paul Bew has been able to come and give us a lecture this evening. Now, Lord Professor Paul Bew, or no, Professor Lord, <laughs> his, uh, <laughs> academic titles come first. So, Professor. Uh, Lord Paul Bew is a historian uh, and he's been professor of Irish politics at Queen's University in Belfast since uh, 1991. Uh, Irish politics, which we're going to hear a bit about this evening, is of course complex and turbulent. Uh, Paul has challenged some of the traditional views of uh, the clashes between different sectors of society in Ireland, and we'll hear more about that, I'm sure. He's written several books, including Land and National Question in Ireland, and Ireland, the Politics of Enmity. And many of us will remember uh, the troubles uh, as they were and how they were experienced across the United Kingdom. Paul, as well as being a historian, is in a sense living history and influencing it also in many different ways. He was a historic advisor to the inquiry into Bloody Sunday, uh, and he was also an advisor to David Trimble at the time that the Good Friday Agreement was being drawn up. Um, he was appointed to the House of Lords in 2007, as a, partly as a consequence of his contribution to the Good Friday Agreement and other aspects. Um, he's been uh, a member uh, of the committee on, I think the chair of the committee on standards in public life uh, between 2013 and 2018. I bet he's glad not to be doing that job at the moment. Uh, however, he has another job, which is to be chair of the uh, House of Lords Appointment Committee. So, uh, from the frying uh, pan to the fire. Uh, so, Paul is going to talk to us uh, on why have the British never understood Ireland? No, I'm all, can I be heard? Yeah, thank, thank, thank you. First of all, I'd very much like to thank Pat for the invitation to thank the British Academy also uh, um, for the invitation. A society like this is tremendously important. I'm now to the historian of ideas, uh, Greta Jones, and uh, who, for example, often Darwinism, British 
cultural life and um, these societies, we in Belfast has the Belfast Natural History and Philosophical Society. It, it's not as August as yours or as long ex in existence, but they're tremendously important in the intellectual history of British history, of British cities. And I'm, I regard it as a great honor to be asked to speak here tonight. And I'm also very grateful to you for coming out because I was joking beforehand that I'd be tempted to say in a beautiful day like this in the back of the garden with a glass of Prosecco in my hand. And I'm quite, and I hope not to disappoint you, I feel a bit more of a burden in view of the fact that you, you, you've given up that option. And I'm very grateful. And that is right to say I have tried to challenge many of the norms of explanation in Irish history as they were when I first became a, a graduate student. We're both mid-70s. PhDs, and there's a certain world, oh, that type of research, which I might recall with some sentimentality as, as this proceeds. But the whole purpose of everything I've written is to try and get people to look at it a bit differently. Uh, even for tonight, when I put forward in the description for the talk, that quote from The Spectator in, 19, in 1897, that the problem of Britain governing Ireland is a problem of a slow-witted people trying to govern a quick-witted one. Uh, is um, I put it down for two reasons. Actually, Spectator then is now was a right of centre political journal, um, not quite so formally Tory, but certainly liberal unionist, uh, and certainly to the right of centre in the spectrum of British politics at the time. And even a journal like that is prepared to put forward an idea of that sort, whereas there is a very conventional wisdom that British thinking about Ireland is so doused in um, ethnic um, superiority or sense of ethnic superiority and racism. Uh, um, it isn't quite as simple as that. It's a much more complicated story in the 19th and in the 20th century. And why Britain gets it wrong is not because it didn't always have people be prepared to say, well, hold on a minute. Maybe they've got a point. Hold on a minute. We should be thinking about this. What's really going on here? There was always a debate, an intense debate, in British political life. Now, one of the things you know, I want to begin with is the disappointments of my professional life and trying to challenge the, these conventional narratives. Um, and it's, um, I should explain perhaps just for a minute, to be honest, about where I'm coming from. I'm actually a child of a mixed marriage. Um, uh, my mother was from a strong Catholic, both my parents were doctors, uh, and then none of them were in religion. They were practical people as so many doctors are, not all of them, but so many are. They've got a broken leg, it's a problem. Problem with your soul, not a problem. Work that out for yourself. And that was the that, that was the, the approach of, of both of my parents. But what I did know, uh, um, and it does influence the first book, Land and a National Question, which is about the Land League Revolution, which transformed Irish nationalism into being a serious force in the mid 80s. In the mid 1870s, no British politician had to spend more than an afternoon thinking about it occasionally. In the 1880s, every senior British politician thought about Ireland probably more than any other single topic. And the Land League movement was at the heart of this. But it was very clear to me immediately because I came on one side of my family, the strong Catholic bourgeoisie of Ireland, that this was not a movement simply of the poor oppressed peasantry. It was a movement of strong farmers, I recognized the people immediately who were in, in, in the book of were My grandfather, my grandfather actually named his house uh, Avondale, in, which is a now listed house in, in, in Ireland, uh, um, after in homage to Parnell, the great leader of nationalism at that time. And this is the first very simple thing. Because so many people in Scotland and so on in particular, but also in England, in Boston, come from poor sections of Irish society. Ireland has always had a stable Catholic bourgeoisie. My great uncle was the longest serving Catholic chaplain in the First World War, say from beginning to the end. And this is a world, and I've tried to link these two worlds and the world of my father's Protestant family and what I write, and I try to respect and hold in tension these two worlds. Um, but there are disappointments in the effort to do it. And one is a slightly Lapped out nature of English um, thinking. They want to go for a simple solution. 
And I want to give you an example of something which I'm sure people in this room will recognize in the last few weeks. You might remember that Laura Trevelyan, who worked for the BBC, initially announced that because her family had a responsibility for slavery, she was making a payment from for, for a family school. So people then immediately popped up and said, ah, yes, uh, what about Sir Charles Trevelyan, who was the senior British administrator during the famine, and who is said by many to be guilty in a major way for the deaths of almost a million people? Why aren't you so concerned about that? Uh, um, and why are you picking one cause rather than another? Um, those of you who are regular attenders of Parkhead will know. Uh, you know, I think I don't think a week goes by without Charles Surveillance being referred to in not very flattering songs uh, uh, in terms of the corn, Surveillance corn leaving Ireland and so on. Um, and in every single non tabloid newspaper, Times, Sunday Times, I kind them all up. Observer, Guardian, Sunday Telegraph, Daily Telegraph, in the last few weeks, every single one has said about Sir Charles Trevelyan that he believed that the Irish um, uh, uh, were feckless, that they bred too much, that, that they were lazy, uh, uh, and God was justifiably punishing them. And you can find a quote in every single one, every single person in this room is likely to have read that quote from Sir Charles Trevelyan. Um, and this is the kind of thing which brings you up against the limits of being a professional historian. In just at the turn of the century, I went to the University of Newcastle Library to look at Sir Charles Surveillance's papers. And there is a correspondence in October 1846 with, with Father Matthew. Some of you in the room are lucky to know that Father Matthew was the great temperance priest. It was great. Actually, he actually did believe the Irish drank too much. Uh, and, um, and that was his great campaign. He was also a friend of Sir Charles's. And it's the beginning of the family. just beginning to work out that this is going to be terrible, that the failure of the potato crop is really bad. And they're just beginning to get the kind of scientific information to come in that's credible and not necessarily exaggerated. And they, so the, the colleagues, they write about this to each other. It's Father Matthew in this correspondence who speculates that God may be punishing the Irish. If anybody does, because as you know, Father Matthew thought the Irish did drink too much uh, and were feckless in that, to that degree. Um, Trevelyan quite explicitly says, no, I do not expect, it is not the, I, I, the this is not a punishment from God. This is uh, 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 and the dangers here are the weaknesses and failures of man and, 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 and human beings in terms of how bad this gets or not. Um, now, it's just remarkable. I mean, so I've read this in it, and I knew that I'd seen this in many, many books. And it starts with an article by Jennifer Hart, partner of HLA Hart, person who first, uh, I'm going to say, had a Important moment as I, 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 I saw Berlin's life, and I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. But Jennifer Hart, and it's, it, it was a, quite a serious historian, Oxford historian, it's an English historical review, 1960, the actual acme of professional history, not, not a casual, half witted journal, not by any means. It just isn't true. I read the letters. She has said, he says that she will have read again in the papers. God was punishing the Irish for, for fecklessness and so on. And she, I've read the papers and I gasped. And the librarian, a very nice woman, Leslie Gordon, came down to me and said, yes, and there was an Australian scholar here a month ago and he burst out gasping as well because the letters say the exact opposite. So when I came to write the Oxford to Ireland, I said it more importantly, Robin Haynes, who wrote a 500-page book on Trevelyan, who told the Australian scholar had been there by a month before me, says it in some detail. Trevelyan did. No, no, did Trevelyan believe God's hand was at work here? Yes, he did. He just didn't believe that the Irish were being punished for the sins of laziness, having too many children, drinking too much, or whatever. He did not believe that at all. 
what he did believe was that God um, was saw that the uh, uh, having a third of the population depended on the potato crop and the way that was developing. Now, this is where you are luck because if you're going to be dependent on one crop, the potato is a really good one to be dependent on, it's nutritious and so on and so forth. But Aaron runs out of luck, all Europe does. He didn't believe that God was, you know, looked at this situation, which was leading to subdivision, particularly in the West of Ireland, tinier, tinier plots, people only surviving because they could survive on potatoes. Uh, and he did believe this was condemning Ireland to a, uh, was a way to ride Ireland's neck to a low standard of life, and that God was, you know, just shifting Ireland to a higher level of civilization. Actually, a large part, including, I suspect, my own Catholic family believed that as well. Um, but they did believe God was saying, but well, I think it was the duty of all the reason to soften the blow, feed the people. Now, again, there's a problem. How much can the state do? All the recent books stress the level of financial constraints, which are real, on the British economy at that time. Gladstone, when he became, thought to be a great friend of Ireland, when he became Chancellor in the 1850s, maintained all these financial constraints and believed that there were pressures on the Treasury. It therefore meant that you had to be charitable yourself. And that there were great efforts in the early phase to raise at a charitable level on the English middle classes pay. You've got to pay. You've got to help these people through this crisis. And it's going to be better because it was a hopeless system, a ramshackle system, bound to collapse someday anyway. So help them through the crisis. Great Catholic church, money collected for the first year. Goes on for four years. And it's absolutely true. Famine fatigue takes over. The London papers are full of stories about rich farmers um, getting a hold of the relief that was sent from, from, from London, not reaching the poorest. All stories you will have heard from any form of famine relief that you are paying attention to in the modern world. Um, so people at first are generous, they know, and then they discover, oh, they, they want to have a rising with Ireland. So what, they've got no money to feed. They're poor people, but they've got enough to buy guns and so on and so forth. And gradually, English uh, uh, humanitarian concern, which Trevelyan did his utmost to promote, gradually fades away. And it's a huge problem. It isn't in human terms much worse than what happens with every famine we hear about anywhere in the world and how we react. But it is if you have decided that Ireland is part of your union. That Ireland, it's politically, that's your problem. You have said on the basis of prosperity, we are making Ireland part of a United Kingdom. We want to create one people across two islands, one imaginative identity. And in that sense, it is an absolute disaster. And while Trevelyan did not believe God was punishing the Irish for their I mean, too many children, particularly too much or whatever, there were lots of English politicians and opinion formers who did. And for example, the owner of the London Times, who was raising this issue against Trevelyan, uh, in the last couple of weeks, which really is, is that the owner of London Times did believe it and said a number of times that God is punishing the Irish for their and, and was furious with Trevelyan because why is Trevelyan trying to give them money? Why is he trying to raise money for them in, in one form or another? Because, you know, they brought it on themselves. Why should we be bothered? And there is that strain in English, but it's not the dominant strain, but it's certainly a serious strain in English public opinion. And there's no question. But the project of the Union, as envisaged by Pitt and envisaged by Burke, that you create one people across two islands, the famine is an absolutely disastrous moment. I'm not in any way taking my revisionism to the point that I, that, that, that I, that I want to question that, because it's simply true and it's unavoidable. Um, uh, 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 and, it, it, you know, and the horror of it, all of this is unavoidable. But the reason why I'm saying or drawing attention to what I'm saying is the limits now. There are two books that I've, of the Oxford History of Ireland, Robin Small's book. Neither of us need to have written a word because the cultivated intelligence, people write, people write the sort of pieces in the Times and the Observer and whatever are not jobbing hacks. These are the more literary types of journalists. And it was just such an appealing line. Gosh. He thought that they, so you go back to Hart. And a number of books carry Hart's, Wedgwood's book on the famine and so on. 
a number of books carry Jennifer Hart's version, and it's just so appealing. But what it brings up to me is, if you write the oxygen around, it's not that you expect your judgments to be, this is where I come back to, uh, Pat Brown, when he produced our PhDs and seventies, expect anyway, he said, oh, you've got that completely right. What we did think was that people would take account of what we tried to say, and if they thought there was something wrong, they would let you know that this is not the case. In Irish history, above all, in Irish history, well, people won't let you know. They won't study. They won't look at carefully at what you've tried to argue. Uh, you wouldn't look at, you know, this chap's been in the University of Newcastle Library, one of the first people to look at Trevelyan's papers for about 25 years. And, he's, and another scholar has done the same. And so that the views attributed to Sir Charles Trevelyan are not the, and the views attributed to Parkhead every, and the role attributed to Parkhead every other week is not actually the case. And you, you, you know, there's no, nobody need bothers to stop and say, oh, I've been, or oh, I've gone back, I've checked the letters or something like that. There's nothing like that. It's just, it's so appealing. It's so wonderful to have that sentence, which is just wonderful to sing the song, to have that sentence which says that the man who was at the heart of, form, uh, of, of the policy of famine relief in the, United, in, in the United Kingdom in this key moment believed that the, um, that the Irish were being justifiably punished by God for fecklessness, having too many children, drinking too much, and so on. Um, and that is not at all what Trevelyan thinks. Trevelyan, by the way, a very sharp critic of, of, of Irish landlords. You want to criticize Trevelyan, it's he's constantly criticizing the Irish social system because he thinks he says it doesn't work. And he very dry comment in one of his books. An Irish gentleman can't even marry, mar get his daughter married without calling in a committee from Dublin Castle to help. His idea is that this is a society with enormous springs of self-help in all classes are broken down, the normal springs of self-activity. But then you have to then ask yourself questions, well, this is a society with the rules of which are ultimately determined over time by British policy. So there's a kind of emptiness at some level in the way that Trillian thought about it, even if you, even if you un understand it. But there's another reason why people love it, because the more that people accept the market, which we do, all of us, as God, then the more you want to blame the famine on racism or an ideological defect or religious bigotry. Actually, the real trouble with the famine, and James Connolly is right, it's the market. The real trouble is the laws of the market and the acceptance of the laws of the market, including the fact that strong, and this is why I emphasize this point of coming from two different Irish traditions, including the fact that the strong farmers of Ireland, not to any who sent the coin, they wanted to export their coin because they wanted to do what my family did, create priests and bishops in the next generation and so on. Uh, and, and, that, and they wanted, you know, they, they also are participants in, in, in this market. And these are uncomfortable facts, but they are, they are, they are very, very real facts. Um, many of the leading families in National Ireland two generations later are come from the families which play a decisive role in consolidating land, getting control of more land, because the people who were previously there died. And that's just, you know, these are, this is just the uncomfortable realities of Irish life. It's no simple tale uh, of, of um, you know, uh, of, that can be covered up in, 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 in a sentimental hue. It, it, so, but I've, I've talked about that for reasons of trying to say that the, the, the whole question of judgment is, is much more complicated than I first appear. Now, I want to come to, because I want to do, I do want to leave time for questions. I want to come to the more modern period and generally British failures of policy. Um, there is a problem in Britain, which is self-image. There is a problem which is an inability to think seriously about political violence, because it's not an important part of the tradition. Even in, some of you might have noticed uh, Michael Barry, a very distinguished scholar, just recently, a London scholar brings out a book on, called The Day of the Assassin. And The Day of the Assassin doesn't include assassins doing anything in England. It's all the great European assassinations. But actually, assassination and violence is a very important part of, 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 of British and how you handle it is very important, but it's not reflected upon. Uh, and the preference is always to push it to one side. 
uh, in, in a way which is, I mean, I, I, you might have noticed in recent days, I'll just give you a very simple example. Um, just because again, it will be in your mind from recent days, but because of Committee on Standards and Public Life and be chairman of it, I do notice these things. Committee on Standards and Public Life was only established as a result of John Major. You may remember there were issues of uh, conservative MPs uh, um, who were allegations of corruption, and he had very few votes. So he couldn't get rid of these MPs. His, his, his majority was fading. Um, but what he could do is set up a committee on science and public life. The values of, uh, you know, what, what were they? I, I do know them. Uh, selflessness, objectivity, openness, honesty, leadership, integrity. Gosh, I do know them. For five years, I tried desperately to insert them. And by the way, if I could say something always what worried me towards the end, that's exactly what Adolf Hitler thought he delivered. That's exactly what. So always in the back of my mind, Hugely, he thought he was totally selfless, totally objective. Uh, honest, open. Haven't you read my hand? I mean, the, the my point about it is, if I can say something, those principles are only valuable in a context where you have a functioning liberal democracy with a free press, parties voting alongside those 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 uh, those the, 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 that fun, functioning of liberal democ democratic institutions. They are valuable, but they've got to the stage now. Or people just talk about them as if there were some, as if the Ted, the Ted Commandments. Actually, they're not quite. And in John Major's case, of course, the most startling example of misleading the Commons is when they merged in 1999, what, 1993, in fact, about the the um, uh, misleading the Commons is when he said it would, it would turn his stomach to engage in negotiations with the Provisional IRA, and documents were published. He was engaging with them at the very point he would say, was, there's nothing like it. Ever since it's such, a, it's a massive matter of public policy. It's not a matter of whether I went to this party or that party. It's massive. I actually believe he was right. I think there are certain, uh, I support completely what he did. Uh, uh, but that's because I have a view of what's at stake here, which is, but nobody will reflect on it. Nobody will say, honest John said that, the return is, what do we mean? Do we, where do we not think about this the right way? And what I think about English life is that the only way you end the sort of campaign that the IRA had, both in 1920 and 1921, and for 25 years in Northern Ireland, is actually by methods of a dirty war, combined with offers of political seductions, nice sweeties, if you end your war. This is horrible. This and you know, absolutely horrible. And let me refer to another frustration that I have Peter Taylor's book, Operation Sheep on Run. Again, people in this room will have heard over a weekend BBC running with Peter's very important book. And Peter Taylor is a good scholar and a good man. There is an obvious question. So we hear we hear this great spook who had gone to talk to Martin McGuinness. And that helped, that's the peace process behind the scenes without political support. That's the essence of the story. Wonderful man, Robert, who died without any recognition. There is a real question here, which is an obvious one. Um, in 1975, the IRA leadership called the ceasefire. And then Sir Frank Cooper, who was a really serious British official, a very serious servant of the British state. Sir Frank, Sir Frank Cooper went to see the IRA at Royal Abroad and said, we will offer you structures of disengagement. Please stop your campaign. Harold Wilson, there was, Harold, Harold Wilson was the Prime Minister, Bernard Donoghue tells me, uh, my colleague in the Lord's Howard Wilson, in his second phase of prime minister, didn't care whether Britain was or was not in what we call the European Union today. He did not care whether Britain did or did not have a incomes policy, which was the big economic issue of 74, 76. What he did care about was that Britain should get out of Ireland. This, of course, by the way, is a hugely worrying thing for the Irish government. And the Irish cabinet secretary, a very able man called Dermot Nally, Right at this time, there is no price too high that Ireland should pay to keep Britain and Northern Ireland. Now, what I'm trying to tell you is the moralities now about all this are just completely true. There's no question. This is the Irish cabinet minutes. This is the real truth. The real truth of, 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 the, of the, the people prefer the parties. They don't ever want to dig beneath the surface. So they then say in 1991, 
isn't it wonderful that this chap, this uh, Robert, uh, as he's called, um, in, in, in Peter, and Peter Taylor's right, this brave man does this thing without really much political support. However, why, why were they, why were they interested in, 19, in the 1990s, the IRA leadership and not? They had executed the 75 leadership, quite literally in some cases, but doing exactly the same thing, putting fancy documents which do not talk about British withdrawal, something you might notice has not happened, uh, which do not talk about that, uh, and give no hint of that, and the previous leadership were swept aside for being so gullible as to sit around the table with Frank Cooper. As I've said, I don't think they were that gullible in a way, because I think that there were people in the British cabinet that Prime Minister particularly did want to leave. Now, I think the majority of the cabinet didn't, from what we need to, would, would not have supported this. But there was certainly reason for wearing a body of the old school of the IRA in 75, 76, to believe that they were getting significant messages. There was far more reason to believe that than when this un relatively junior official turns up in Derry with the messages which have now been published. Why do they believe it? They believe in it because for different reasons they're exhausted. And one the reason they're exhausted is the head of their internal security squad has been a British agent for 10 years. Johnny Adams' is chief of staff has been a British agent for 20 years. It's a dirty war. All these things are to keep that in, 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 agent of the head of their internal squad in the play, in security squad in place, there was no question that the British state connived at murder because they didn't, I, I do have a spy at that level in a part of the want to keep. Uh, and his job is to kill informers. Then I'm afraid he's going to kill some of the other informers who are caught. So he's not exactly what is said by oper Operation when, 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 the, when Mr. Boucher completes his inquiry. There is no question that the agents are playing at God and so on. This is dirty war. What I am saying to you is we don't have a language to talk about it. We, we, we don't acknowledge what is the truth that the combination of, of, of dirty war plus blandishments were our political goodies coming your way. That's how it was done the first time and how it was done the second time in 1921. And it was done leading to Michael Collins' Con compromise. And we don't have a discourse. When they did it the second time, they didn't even know they were copying the first time. There is, you know, a revulsion in the mainstream British political mind, understandable maybe, but it is absolutely infuriating. And the result is that the whole discussion of the British Party Agreement, I'm very proud of the, the role that I had in parts of that, but the whole discussion in the last few weeks has become semi-religious. Actually, there was no religious turnabout uh, on any side, and no particular great improvement of, 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 of breakthrough of human decency. What there was was a political struggle in which both sides were winning. Not trying not to get a knockout this time, but at least a technical knockout. Uh, and, and that's what was going on there. The way it's been presented in the last week or two weeks, I, I speak as the person who turned up in Comedy Cathedral to be grateful to accept the prize of Mark Durkin for my role in it last Friday. Um, and, and very happy to do it and the touch to do it. Um, Nonetheless, and I would do it all again. Nonetheless, it was not as it was portrayed in the last few weeks. Uh, it was a hard political struggle. And the context is the one I have just described. Dirty war combined with carrots from the peace process, producing a view that ultimately, if, you're, if you know that your head chief of staff has been for 20 years informing the British, if you know that your head of internal security, and there were loads, loads more, you know but the game is up and you better take the opportunity to um, swan around in the television studios and so on. And it was clearly signal to the British state, to the Republican leadership. If you do that, we'll forget about all this other nasty stuff. This is how it happened. We just need to talk honestly about these things. I believe John Major was right to do what he did. Um, and to defend. But then we need to say there are circumstances in which you may not tell the whole truth to Parliament. At this moment in our current climate, nobody would dream uh, of, of, of saying such a thing um, for totally different and other reasons. Um, and perhaps that's right. But there is a, in fact, I'm sure it's right that nobody would dream of it. But having said that, there is a way of thinking about our problems which are, uh, uh, which, which are unrealistic. And it's a lack of, I don't know why to put it, real politic, toughness of mind. And 
English mind would uh, I say not just an English mind, I say and I'm speaking in Glasgow, revolts from these tough and unpleasant conclusions. Now I want to get one other motif here, because I do want to leave time for questions. Um, and that is the case of Mr. Gladstone. And there are two Gladstone's conversion to home rule has fans on the liberal historians who say he got it right saw the need for home rule, saw there was a very large, and this is completely true, democratic demand for home rule in Ireland. What else will a medical decent man do but to say there must be home rule for Ireland? That's, and, and there's a school of thought that says this. And by the way, if you look at the evolution debate for Scotland, it is fueled by people saying, we missed the opportunity in Ireland and we lost Ireland. If we have evolution for Scotland, it will work. It will be fine. And it would have been fine in Ireland for these short sighted men, selfish Tories, bigoted Ulster Unionists, stop Gladstone doing the good and Christian thing. There is a different and conservative school of thought, much more cynical about why Gladstone did what he did. And uh, Cook and Vincent in their work, and there's even up to this day, Alistair Cook, now Lord Lexon, sustains that more cynical line of Gladstone. But the evolution for Scotland. You go back to the debates, people again and again referred to the Gladstone example. Evolution was right when you're confronted with a natural question, and, and it will work. Now, I now know, we all know in this room, nobody quite knows where Scotland now is going, and the events of the last few weeks have been very dramatic. This is not my point. My point is that nobody, if you read the debates of 1997, there's not a single wise speaker who says, you're going to have devolution for Scotland and the next thing over the next 20 years, the Scottish National Party is going to be the leading party. Nobody. And that is because we don't have a, we have a way of thinking about things, particularly in the liberal mindset, which is just oversimplistic. So Gladstone was right, wasn't applied then, we're now applying a right and modern Gladstoneism. It must actually work. Um, and there's a, there are a huge number of problems about this. Um, in my, by the way, I should explain, very late in the day, on the same second home rule, that so does suddenly say, oh, there is a problem by Ulster. Um, we should have thought about this earlier. Again, it's totally forgotten in the liberal tradition. It, liberal historians do not write about the fact that that so gets up in May 1893 in Parliament and says, yeah, maybe we've, we, we've pushed that problem too easy to one side, Ulster unionism, uh, 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 and uh, it's something that Churchill did see comments on really rather brilliantly in his brilliant essay on, on, on Parnell. So the, 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 uh, there's this the Gladstone liberal sentimentality in turn went into a, 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 a looking, looking at debate on Scotland, which actually just looks, whatever you think, whether you like Scottish National Party, whether you don't, whether you like Scottish devolution or whether you don't, what is not in doubt is that the entire debate was constructed in an unreal, un, un, unreal just read those passages uh, and um, in, a, in a rosy tone, and it is because of an inheritance of an ability to think seriously about uh, about nationalism and, and, and what it, what it means, and a, and a sentimentality derived from the idea that if only Gladstone had been allowed to do what he wanted to do, Ireland would not be separate. Um, and you know, you were sure, are we? Um, Ireland was a Polish country with a social radical base of the Dublin working class. Um, most of the nationalist leaders were conservative and right of centre. We're sure that a home rule elite, tacking to very conservative lines, would actually not have produced a revolt internally in Ireland, at least at the level of what you've seen in Scotland. The answer is you can't be sure at all. But everybody decided that they were sure. That of course, if Mr. Redmond had been delivered home rule for Ireland and been allowed to do it, everything would have been fine. And Ireland would still be in the United Kingdom, um, something which I personally deeply wish could have happened, but it's long gone. Uh, and by the way, it's long gone partly for the reasons to do with the famine and the bitterness left behind, which I discussed in the earlier part of this talk. But the thing I want to comment on is also not just this, the roseate hue of liberalism, a lack of tough-mindedness in, 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 in dealing with that legacy. But I want to look at the great political assassination, the fascination which is the heart of this period, which is the assassination of Lord Frederick Cavendish in the Phoenix Park at the beginning of May 1882. 
Um, that is a key, key moment because a few days before, Gladstone has decided to end the policy of internment of, of the Land League organizers, release Parnell from jail uh, and his friends. Parnell has sent Gladstone a letter saying, I'm going to use the guys, particularly a guy called PJ Sheridan, who, um, the others, but this is the key name at this point, who were doing the violence in the west of Ireland. You let us out, I'm going to count it down. Parnell was totally sincere in that. So this is the deal in 1882. That's what it is. It's a totally, I mean, everybody talks about, there's just no question what it is. It's a deal with men and violence. I let you out of jail. You stop your guys. And, that, and Gladstone, Parnell's letters to Gladstone in the days before. And, and he mentions particularly P.J. Sheridan. Um, P.J. Sheridan is the paymaster for the assassin group that kills Lord Frederick Cavendish who was put in as the new Liberal um, uh, uh, um, Chief Secretary in Dublin. And he sent to Dublin, Foster, who old type authoritarian Liberal, says, I'm not very along with this policy. It's totally shady. It's totally corrupt. Out he goes. And he's sacked by Gladstone. The new young guy, who's actually a relative of the Gladstone family, goes in. Christian, decent guy, going to do justice to Ireland, turn the page. No more internment, which is a disgrace to Britain with its liberal ideals throughout Europe. So we've locked up a thousand people. No, absolutely not. We're getting rid of all that. You can see the appeal. We've disgraced ourselves. Let's get rid of it. Your only problem is that the assassin group, which has um, been set up, the Invincibles, is still active. And no sooner does Lord Frederick Cavendish arrive, he's, he's actually sliced into little bits in sharp knives in, in, in the Phoenix Park. Now, how do you behave here? You've got letters from Gladstone saying, to, to Gladstone and Parnell five or six days before saying, I'm going to go to Sheridan. There is some considerable evidence that the day before the murders, Parnell actually went to Sheridan with a view to saying to him, have it down now, guys, new situation, stop it. But this assassination was already in play. Assassination, it's the biggest assassination in 19th century British history. The point that you have to really understand now, and for a while the Conservatives think Gladstone is going to have to give up this policy. It's too embarrassing. It's too much covered in blood. And embarrassment is always a major thing. I was saying to Pat the other day in the light of a recent program with um, uh, um, Campbell uh, um, uh, about with, 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 with Jerry Adams and so on. One thing that Campbell did in the Blair period during the Peter process, you'll never see a picture of Jerry Adams and, and, and Tony Blair shaking hands. Why? Because if a bomb went off, there would be a Daily Mail the next day. There is no picture in that period. You think of all the stuff that went on in Downing Street, you'd think there'd be a picture of the two of them together. There is none. And that is because Blair's uh, press advice was quite right. Don't take the risk. What's the point? If this goes wrong, or, and you'll never see a picture. But what I'm trying to say to you is now this is the, these kind of calculations are covered in a dross of, 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 of humanitarian gap, frankly, in the last two or three weeks. But that was the reality at the time. So this, but to go back to Gladstone, he's trapped. That's the thing about it. I was going to quote, there's an article, most people in Britain had more things to think about. A, a, an article left behind by Jasper Tully, who was the MP for Roscommon at this time, published by his son in the Roscommon Herald, who describes this moment. Tully knew that the Parnell's aides were close involved in violence. He knew he wanted to call it off, but he knew this. He describes the connections, the weapons brought into the country, everything. And he says that he had actually trapped Gladstone. Uh, Paro didn't intend to trap Gladstone because he didn't know the murder was happening. But Gladstone was trapped because either you said, you didn't turn around and say, I, I can't read that history. Or even though I let you out, you wrote to me and said PJ Sheridan would stop this violence and so on. That was the basis of the deal, the so called Comanum Treaty. This assassination is now happened. I'm not I can't rewrite it. I'm trapped. I'm now in this process. That's what a peace process means. You're trapped. And you can be very, and, and that's why Blair was always living in terror that a bomb would go off when he began this thing, because he was afraid 
and he will be trapped quite right to be similarly terrified. But Gladstone was trapped into this alliance with National Asylum. And at the heart of it is a really brutal assassination and covering it up and the connections between partisans and that assassination. I mean, by the way, my work on Parnell, this is a very reluctant connection from Parnell's point of view and stresses his conservatism. Uh, um, and he's a very attractive figure in many ways now. Uh, a new book coming out of this on ancestral voices in Irish politics, which tries to talks more about these difficulties for Oxford University Press later this year. So I'm not, this is not meant to be anti parnal It's meant to say that we, it is time that we started facing up to the role of violence, how we handle it in British political history. That the liberal, uh, a, a global liberal cover-ups won't work, and conservative collusion in it won't work either. Because in the late 1880s, the conservatives would dig at this and dig at this. And, and Parler would say, um, well, actually, yeah, they're digging at this. And Parliament's tacitly say, I know why they're digging at this, because there's something there. But they were quite prepared to do deals with me as well in 1885. So if they're so narrowly upset at what they think is this debt beneath the surface, why were they prepared to do a deal with me in 1885? So I shouldn't overuse the word liberal here. But what I do think is that one of the problems in British thinking about how I'm going to with this is an inability to talk honestly about violence. I talked today about nationalist violence, but as Pat said, I was the historical advisor of the Bloody Sunday Tribunal. I have written at some length about British violence, and at questions I will talk about that. But to, 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 for, for, for an audience like this, if I was in Dublin, I'd, I'd, I'd probably change the emphasis. But nonetheless, for an audience like this, I think the point is, is to stress the lack of tough-mindedness by which, in the way that we characteristically look at these things. And the last few weeks about the Good Friday Agreement, the sentimentality to which I have contributed, and I'm guilty as charged at certain points, the sentimentality about what happened 25 years ago is also fundamentally anti truth in its bias. And the best way to preserve peace and an understanding between the two islands is to actually be as truthful and as accurate as we can and acknowledge the difficulties and acknowledge some of this story is actually really quite unpleasant. Thank you. I do want to give time for questions. Oh, yes, thanks very much. Uh, I'm just going to ask if you have a, if you offered a job in the future to advise another island is the constitution, what would you Things in order to keep the uh, uh, working class on board, or, 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 to, or at least to stop going mad in a certain sense. Uh, if, if you're off for that, job, thanks very much. Thank you. I mean, can I say that a few years ago the answer would have been an easy one? You know, in terms of making sure that the, the Catholic parts of the Irish Constitution are changed. The truth is, Ireland has changed. I mentioned that, I, you know, on one side of my family, my, my, my uh, great uncle was the longest serving Catholic chaplain in the British Army. In the world that he and other priests in my family knew when I, up till well into the 80s, it's just disappeared just like that. And what we, and this is our problem with this. What we have discovered is that Catholicism is an inessential part of Irish tribalism. Now, if you had said that at any point between 1830 and, 19, and, 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 and the present day, if you had said it at any point, people would have said nonsense. It's gone. It no longer is. Therefore, one of the things that, you know, probably in the back of your mind is securities to unionists. Uh, um, you know, the, uh, in terms of the offer of the Catholic state church, it's no longer relevant. I wouldn't even bother. Um, the, the, there is a real problem here uh, uh, about where things are going, and you will be well aware that for the first time, the unionist vote was less than nationalist vote. The unionist vote dropped 10% in five years, since the 19th, and it's turned out, basically. Um, nobody knows where it went to in 2017, when it was a huge vote. 
and nobody knows where it came from, rather, and nobody knows where it went to. And nobody knows, well, everybody does know part of the reason that DUPs had several psychodramatic breakdowns in the period of in, in the last five years, and Brexit. But Brexit was already in play, profoundly destabilizing of Irish politics. The irony is when we're talking about Robert, talking about those peace processes, those secret negotiations, Robert's document says, well, that both Britain and Ireland as in the European Union guarantees Irish unity. In fact, it didn't. We have 25 years since Robert Singh, no, 35 years since Robert's little intervention, no sign of it, right? It, but Britain leaving the European Union undoubtedly strengthened nationalism, undoubtedly, uh, uh, in all types of ways, including a significant minority of Northern Protestants who, who thought it was a really bad idea. I personally was against Brexit purely because I thought it would make trouble in Ireland. I have to say it's made 10 times more trouble than it's actually meant that I actually thought of my worst nightmares. It's, it could be about to come to an end. Uh, the conventional wisdom not proven is that the DUP will join the part sharing government in September. Then a new game starts. Nobody knows does this radical decline in the unionist vote continue or not. And, this, and at this level, democratic factors are not really relevant in, in this period of time. And nobody knows whether a restabilized unionism can start getting that inspiring its electorate the way it did, even into the early phase of Brexit. So nobody knows. So it's a slightly hypothetical question. Finally, about the Protestant working class, it was the hegemonic class, a bit like Catholic priests on the other side. It was the hegemonic class when I was growing up in Northern Ireland. It is no longer. That is as simple as that. It is actually, and, and, and I don't say this with any pleasure, but it is no longer the hegemonic class within unionism. What it thinks will not determine the outcome to the sort of questions that, you, that you're that you raising. It's just no longer the hegemonic class. Thank you very much for an enjoyable stroll through history. However, I, I thought tonight's lecture might deal much more with current affairs and even affairs of the last half century, because you're quite right about Blair and Jerry Adams. A handshake would have resulted in a bomb. Wilson talked to the IRA, nearly came to a deal, and 10 years later, the Brighton bomb happened. Yeah. Why? Well, I mean, I did try to, but I'm more than happy to say a bit more about that. I wasn't saying that he was right. But I'm just saying they were consistently in. Alistair Campbell was, was, they were consistently nervous and quite rightly in Blair's camp that the, the whole thing could explode. And they did a lot. Something, something's not terribly ethical behind the scenes to make sure that nothing exploded. They were, they were quite right to have that concern because the embarrassment would be total and unavoidable. And that means you are to a degree trapped. You have to believe and so Jerry will say, I'm some deputy commission, I can't tell you when, but you know, might be this year, might be next year. Uh, I mean, the two governments say in 1993, both governments, the Irish government as well, that this peace process depends on the IRA not having a temporary ceasefire and refusing to decommission. The IRA responded eventually to that demand. It took 14 years before they actually did it. That's how long they struck it out. Their victory was, by the way, in that area, the politics of the gun and holding on to the gun and the latent threat, not on the constitutional political questions, where they were not at the races in those talks. Uh, um, Mark Durkin, when I made him a first minister of Northern Ireland, when I was with him Coventry Conceder on Friday night, was in total control of all the constitutional political aspects of the settlement, along with David Trimble. But their victory was in the politics of the gun, which was in turn destabilizing, because the thing that Garrett Fitzgerald said should never happen did happen. Garrett Fitzgerald said they shouldn't be able to call it off and then retain the right to retain war against their fellow Irishmen and women for the next 10 or 15 years and use it as a negotiating lever. Now, actually, they did. That's exactly what did happen, what the Irish Prime Minister said should never happen. Precisely what did happen. The latest 206 is an IRA statement threatening the, threatening the British government with a return to violence and threatening Blair. Now, it worked. Blair made a gamble that it would ultimately work. And it's enormously to his credit. 
and I always admired the way he and Jonathan Powell handled it. That which was a really, really high risk. And it's not, and if you're looking back at what Wilson did lean into doing all this, as you rightly say, and so, you know, and, and so, and, and so did Roy Jenkins. I think virtually nobody else in Wilson's cabinet uh, uh, was sympathetic to this point of view. But what really, really matters here is what the Irish government thought. And we really just, people have got, that's why I talk about the Irish bourgeoisie, of which I'm partly a child, respectable Ireland. It really does matter. It really does exist. And it knows there's something more important than I've been in Boston Irish bars and the latest song that night and the latest cherry club. It knows it. There's a man there with a checkbook. There's a man there who goes, how do we pay for this? There's a man there. That's why the cabinet secretary says in, in, in the minute, which is in my book, there's no price too high that Ireland could pay to keep Britain in Northern Ireland. No price too high is what the Irish, when, when they found out that, that, that Harold Wilson was playing these games, the Bernard Donnelly was run up by the Irish cabinet secretary. And he said, the Irish cabinet secretary said, we hear you're thinking of something very radical. That's withdrawal. And Bernard said, yes, well, what do you think? And, and they're both carrying them one, one removed from Bernard also from Kerry, first generation. And, and, and the Irish have said, no, no, we think this is far too premature. This is what you've really got. When people think in this side of the IRC about Ireland, they actually don't much think about respectable Ireland. Now, one of the problems is respectable Ireland is a bit in retreat because part of what respectable Ireland was was old school Catholic Ireland. Nobody quite knows, and I've said to you, I think it's dead, old, old school Catholic Ireland. Nobody, but the tribalism is still there. Uh, um, and so on. Uh, the, 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 you know, the, these things are, are, still, are still there in the culture. And nobody quite knows where this is going. But it is worth remembering always that there is an obdurate Ireland which is determined to make our work, which does know what the bottom line is financially. And therefore, the right, uh, I will still ask, even when Ireland is so rich today, how do we replace the 15 billion British subvention? Even now that Ireland now is richer than it's ever been in my lifetime, by some long way, there is still somebody, I can assure you, sitting in the Department of Finance doing the calculations. I used to meet them during the negotiations of Good Friday Agreement. One reason why I was so sure that it would work in constitutional terms is I knew that if you want to know what government think, you find the people who run the economy. You don't find the foreign secretary in, in Boston, in a Boston bar, who will be telling you the story of Ireland. And in fact, if you anything to compare to tonight, the importance, the absolute importance of, of the officials at the department, like the department of finance and their ruthless re realism. The skill with which Ireland, by the way, recovered from its enormous financial collapse 2008 to 2010. Tell the Germans you can do anything you like, impose anything else at all, but we will not change our tax breaks for international companies. Anything else you want, will do, but not change the tax breaks. That was brilliant. It worked. Now look at now look at the scale of the foreign investment now on the scale of the recovery. These are tough, shrewd people. And Ireland is, has tough, shrewd people, not just people with, you know, guitars and machine guns. Um, I quite like this question there, and there are some at the back, but I quite like to ask you a question myself, Paul. You use the term uh, dirty war yeah. frequently, and, yeah. and of course, people like Jerry Adam at the time, they considered themselves at war. Yeah. But what is a clean war thing? Well, there's, I'm saying, I'm using the word dirty war to describe what the British government did both in 1920, 1919, 20 to 21. And without any sense, I agree the practitioners in the late space well, that they were repeating something that was in the history books. No sense whatsoever uh, uh, that there was, there was a, uh, that, that, that they just stumbled into it. And they stumbled into it because there is only one way of dealing with a terrorist movement. It's not a real war, because they always have the advantage of surprise, right? 
they decide when to attack. You get the upper hand if you penetrate them, which to a very considerable degree, not in Saitama, by the way, but certainly in Belfast. The reason why Jerry Adams in the end comes to the table is he's well aware of how penetrated they are, right? So the dirty war is that you penetrate. There's no other way of dealing with it. It's not like the Second World War where you don't rig up the Germans and say we're attacking tonight or whatever. It's nothing like that. There's no, the, 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 and, and nor does that happen. On the, you know, there's no signaling. Um, the, 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 what goes on is shooting with policemen. In the case of the IRA war, 1919, 21, 300 Catholic policemen, essentially. Uh, um, in, in, in Northern Ireland later, it's also about 300 policemen uh, um, who are mostly going about their normal policing business and somebody steps out from behind a hedge and shoots them dead. That's what it was. It, that's the nature of this conflict. Uh, you could say that's a dirty war. I take it, but it is, it is, there's no clean war. That's what you're inviting me to say. But I'm saying the UK has to face up to the fact and just say, that, you know, the truth is there was no alternative of penetration. But if you penetrate, for example, in the case of Freddy Scavatici, he was head of the Nothing Squad, the Internal IRA Security Squad. During his time, for the last 10 years he was in that role, he was a British spy. During his time, he continued to shoot people who were also British spies to preserve his cover. And by the way, the Irish police did similar things. And this would have been known by his handlers, right? That, 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 that people would know that one of their other spies, less low down the food chain, was going to be shot tonight by one of their senior spies. This is horrible stuff. It is truly, truly horrible. But I do think perhaps I'm reacting too much to the semi religious nature of the 25th anniversary. But I do think that people have to face up. There really isn't any doubt about this. And when uh, Chief Constable Boucher produces his report, that will become quite clear what was done. Now, I mean, the person who appointed uh, Prince Scavatici to be head of the Nutting Squad was Jerry Adams. That's the key appointment, the key initiator in this process. Apparently, three other members of the Nutting Squad are now saying the papers were three other of the people busily shooting other unfortunate low-grade spies discovered or alleged spies. But this is this, this, there's a significant number of bodies there, at least more than 20. Uh, and it's horrible. And there is, in that, and the British government makes a decision, which is Freddie is so valuable. And we need Freddie. And this is my other point about it, you know, this particular guy, Robert. Now they didn't need, there wasn't just Robert who was going back and forth. They, had, they were coming down in information about the IRA. You had Adams as chief of staff for 20 years. You know, coming down, the, the problem was you had to interpret all this stuff when you were so and so from the peace process, so and so isn't, and so on. How do they interpret it? Um, there was even an argument by some that some of the people who died in this period were selected by British government agents, either their agents or whatever because they were known to be against the peace process. And the people who were believed that would ultimately come through that Adams and McGuinness were protected, basically. Certainly, they tried to do the same in 1921. And, and sometimes they get it wrong, by the way. Who do you protect? Who's the one who's really going to, Lord George's phrase was, deliver the goods. Who's going to deliver the goods? Peace. Um, you mentioned uh, Tony Blair, John Major, uh, Harold Wilson, Churchill, Parnell, Gladstone. You haven't mentioned Margaret Thatcher. Good, but true. True. I mean, what, uh, there were 35,000 British troops in Northern Ireland at one time. Yeah. Um, is, there, is there any effect, is there a Thatcher effect in all of this that you might have identified? Well, I think you have, in, in the book, I do, I do discuss Thatcher, but actually it's a very shrewd point. Uh, and to be honest, the, the thing about Thatcher is that there's one policy in all the many policies connected with our life, and I'm sure there are warm memories in the room for the poll tax in Scotland and so on. If, if, if all the many policies in our life, the only big public policy that she said I got it wrong was her Irish policy. If you read her, her memoir, she's very explicit that the agreement of 85, which she went for, was a mistake. 
but she did, did there's there's no question about how important that that agreement is in demoralizing unionism a long term its effects can still be felt today even though she herself and the reason why by the way that, that she thought it was a mistake was that she didn't get the return in terms of cross-border security cooperation that she had expected she says in her memoirs four years after that agreement which i had signed at great expense in terms of trouble with the unionists and um Four, four years after that, I, I, I had the worst security cooperation with Ireland than any other country in Europe. And that's something she says in her memoir. So that is the Thatcher story. The under Thatcher, which is the thing everybody, you know, the Amy said, Iron thing. It's the one area of her life that she wasn't. It's the one area of her political life where she expressed doubts later on about how she's handled it. And again, my point about assassinations. Her advisor in opposition was Harry Neve. And he was assassinated. And by removing Harry Neve, well, he was actually in the assassinated Harry Neve in the Palace of Westminster by blowing him up. They actually removed a source of advice to her, which would never have tolerated the agreement of 85. And they removed, now, and Neve is extraordinarily interesting. I, I don't know anybody in the room has read Neve's Nuremberg book, but if you think it's a kind of public schoolboy book about, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, somebody, you know, who'd been a cultist and so on, and rah, rah, and, you know, that kind of, kind of public school RAF kind of thing. It's actually a really, he was, a, as a junior officer, then, then out of cultist, the wars, he actually spends during all the trials with the Nazis. And this is a man of really considerable moral sentiment. It's a really remarkable book. The people who blew him up thought they were terribly radical, they're anti-fascist. His Nuremberg book is one of the great anti-fascist books produced in, by a British officer, and there's no public school brain at all. There is no English chauvinism at all. He's just grimly facing every day, dealing with these people, Goebbels and so on, going to their cells and, and, and writing calmly about the situation. It's a deeply moving book. He was a really a serious uh, a moral person. Of that, there is no doubt. Again, his assassination, like Ian Guy's own assassination, frequently works. This is my point about Michael Burns, which I'm not mentioning it. Assassination, Cavendish assassination worked. Um, the one that didn't work is Henry Wilson in 1922, because um, that provoked Churchill to say to Michael Collins, enough is enough. Uh, and either you start the Civil War now, or we're coming back. What he would have done is another thing, but that, the assassination for Henry was is the one of all the political assassinations um, that I've seen. There have all, in terms of Irish political life in my lifetime and historically, and I'm now talking, you're talking about eight or nine, they all worked at a minimum by removing a significant element against the Irish Republican consensus of those people who carried out the assassination. Assassinations actually work. Another thing, in most cases, uh, and only, it's only by accident that he didn't. And Sir Henry Wilson, it's by, at the moment the history was in, it didn't work. It, it was backfired. But mostly they don't. Mostly they don't. Uh, we've got a couple of online questions from our audience online. Um, the first of these, uh, Lord Pugh's defence of Charles Trevelyan is fascinating, but relies on one exchange of letters which contradicts a number of references in the Wikipedia page on Trevelyan. Uh, is it not true, for example, that in a letter to Lord Monteagle, Trevelyan refers to the famine as the judgment of God and refers to the real evil as being the moral evil of a selfish, perverse and turbulent character of the people? Yes, uh, I mean, it's completely true. He does use it. But I said that in what I said just, uh, I said that Trevelyan does talk about the judgment of God. And it's a judgment of God on a failing social system. You can't carry on like this with a third of the population. Uh, you know, smaller and smaller farms. You, you, a third of the, pop the Irish population is of 8 million. About, about a third of the people are dependent on the potato alone. It's preventing social development and so on. People shouldn't be allowed to die. He says that again and again. 
we, the English people, have a right uh, of duty because of the union to intervene to make sure they don't die. And, and we get them through this transition. But the transition is a good transition. I did say that. Uh, and when he says it's a rotten system, well, I refer to that as well. I said that he did have a rather, in my view, rather abstract view that the whole Irish social system, the landlords were incompetent, incapable, etc. Everybody was hopeless. I, I'm saying, well, you've got a bit of a responsibility. These are the political structures, the social structures, which the union has brought. And you can't just say, oh, I, I'm really furious about these people. Uh, the springs of self-activity don't exist in Irish society, which they strikingly didn't in the way that either in, 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 in Glasgow at the time or London, the springs of self-activity did exist. Uh, you can't just say, so I, I'm, I'm utterly, and that's why I said I thought there was a strong case for James Connolly's view of the famine. But the reason why people go for the Trevelyan quote and why they love it so much is it's everybody open mind, close mind. We know it's religious bigotry. We know it's cruel, punishing providentialism, and that's the explanation. And, and, and it's so neat, it's so lovely, it just is not true. And, and it's very clear when he writes to, 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 to Father Matthew that he is not in that place. But it's so seductive. Uh, and I, I don't believe for a minute, when I complain about that people are going to see anything different about Parkhead the next time, next season. I don't assume for a minute anything's going to be different. Of course, it's going to be like that. And there's enough truth broadly in the song uh, about the famine for, for, for it to, to be, as that sort of political historical song goes, to be credible. But I do find it exasperating that the quality papers, without exception, ten of them, and I, every day I read this passage, and I knew it was the heart. The one passage that they quality papers ran with is the one passage which is definitely demolished as something that Trevelyan never had said. Uh, thank you. And uh, the second question we've got online. Will we see a united Ireland before we see an independent Scotland? I, I, I want to say that a brief second of state, but I used to talk quite a lot to now dead to Patrick Mayhew. Patrick Mayhew always used to say to me that the, the test for the union was going to come first in Scotland, not Northern Ireland. That's a very, well, at the point he was saying it to me, it was long before the SNP became the force they have been in the last several years. Uh, when he was still the Secretary of State. So he said to him, the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland. So that was, uh, he ceased to be that in when Blair won the election in 1997. It was at the latest, he said, in 1996. And in a way, given the fact we've had a referendum, we've had to strike, in a way, I think you could argue history as 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 as, as, as at least gives him some credit for talking like that. I never had met any of the answers. He said it's going to come first, the big challenge. The, and certainly the big referendum did come first here. Uh, uh, and, and the survival of the union is going to be tested. It could still be the case. Now, we have a situation that unionism has had a nervous breakdown over the last five years. It can't mobilize its vote. Uh, and as I said, in, people forget that in 2017, it had a huge vote. And at the various, it's showing all kinds of macabre neurotic symptoms. Um, the, the reaction to the Windsor framework was ridiculous, but no, that's wrong. It was not ridiculous, but it was deeply flawed and unserious. And there, there is no sign of, I shouldn't use these sweeping phrases, objectivity. There was no sign of a serious engagement with a complicated document. There's no question that it is an improvement in that position. Right? There's just no question that it responds very substantially to the critique, the valid parts of their critique. It leaves several problems still, things that they don't like, and I understand that completely. But the reaction was weak. Um, there is a con uh, intellectually weak. There is a sense that somehow or other by September, Devolution will return to Northern Ireland. 
It mm -hmm. is a co-premiership, but it's not an issue, and I'm deeply critical of the DUP's behaviour in the last few weeks. But what is not an issue is the issue of serving it set under her, under Sinn Féin. It is a co-premiership. It's quite simple. There is no difference at all. There's a kind of prestige bit, but it is not an issue. That is not what will stop them in going in in September. There are two parallel universes. Anybody on the inside track in Northern Ireland will tell you, oh, they're coming back in September. I'm not sure. I haven't seen the public evidence for that so far. And there's a section of the party officers of the DUP who are determined not to go back. There's one question over there who's been waiting. Uh, the Irish journalist um, and RTE Europe correspondent, Tony Conway, a man from Derry who studied in Dublin, knows the island well and its relationships, wrote a book about Brexit before yeah. it happened, explaining uh, not just the politics, but the economics of the complicated flows over yeah. borders, not just the Irish border, but the border between Britain and Ireland. Why do you think, and, and many other people were writing similar things in Ireland, why do you think that the uh, British Conservative Party, um, which claims to understand business, wasn't hearing those kind of messages? Okay, I mean, it's a perfectly fair point. And I've said myself that I was against Brexit because I could see it would, um, I don't understand business. I could see it would create trouble in Ireland. But it is important to understand um, I mean, basically, the simple short answer is most of the Tories, even those who were pro-Brexit, never thought they'd win. It's very, very simple. Nobody thought they'd win. And those on the Remain side have to really come to terms with why did they fail to convince people? What was at stake here? And I've never been happy with the attempts of the House of Lords to try and pretend as if a referendum result hadn't happened. But then the short answer is they didn't devote much thought because they never thought they were going to be tested on this question, but they were very slow. Tony Connolly's book's a very good book, but it's only really the beginning of the story um, as regards, and there needs to be another book about Ireland and Brexit. The crucial thing is Theresa May man managing to lose the election effectively to, to uh, Corbyn. Uh, and, and the run into, calling the election, the run into the election, and then she was so desperate for anything that she could present to Parliament for a deal. She just, her previous commitments that she'd given about Northern Ireland just collapsed. And Theresa May, I don't blame her, the woman was on her knees, but the negotiation, both in the 2017 joint report, EU, uh, in the November, the, sorry, December the 8th, 2017 report, and then the first iteration of her withdrawal agreement is a huge, intellectual collapse by the British state. By the way, another thing about British state, we just don't deal with failures. We just never, um, I said I'm exasperated by the inability to discuss violence. There's a more general answer. When will people face up to intellectual failures? This was an intellectual failure. The leading Irish official in these negotiations said he was embarrassed by the collapse of the British negotiation. Says he couldn't believe it when he was in his taxi that it collapsed. He said they allowed us to interpret the Good Friday Agreement. Took over the interpretation of Good Friday from which Britain pays for and is half the crown trail. You allow somebody else to take over the interpretation. This is the lead Irish official saying, I couldn't believe it and it went too far. Um, you know, this is the scale of what. So losing the election political conjuncture is very, very, very important. And Boris's deal is slightly better, actually, from a more balanced, because it brings in the more balanced assembly. Theresa May, we all now accept. Please say in this room, there's a problem with democratic deficit in Northern, that these things laws are coming from Europe. Somehow or other, the assembly must have some discussion role play in any democracy. You can't just impose top down from outside. Everybody now accepts this. It's not in the May agreement. There is no role for the Northern Ireland Assembly. Boris did actually begin the process of giving it a certain role. The, the agreement now. The Winter Creek gives it a very significant role. It's not perfect. It's a complicated set of interactions. But we move from no role 
there was an assumption that bureaucratic deficit is very important, that something significant has to be done about it. And one of my irritations with the DUP is that they sit on their hands and don't pay attention to the fact. Because there's not really a perfect outcome for them or anybody here. But it was clearly wrong that this was a total top down imposition. And I, I, Theresa had lost the election. She was on, the, on her knees. These things happen to politicians. But that's what I wanted to say about that. So that's a, a, a lot, uh, an answer to your question by the Conservative Party and Brexit. And you can't really defend it. You're right. So this will be the last question. Sure. Well, sure. I'm going to you the continent blame God. Is God responsible for this no, I didn't. I didn't blame God. I said. I said that there's an argument that the world that the Trevelyan is accused of blaming God, which he at least he didn't believe God was punishing the Irish. And I was saying that the world, to be fair, you know, other English politicians who actually did think God was punishing the Irish for their fecklessness and other failures, right? I wasn't myself blaming God at all. I don't think God. God, God had had that. No, that's really good for any agreement. Well, I did operate, I was in operate by last month, and as the injection went to my arm, the specialist said to me, we obviously felt about things in the way I'd say my parents were in the pragmatic school of doctor. Um, he said to me, were they good? He, he just heard the radio program I'd done with Jonathan Parr and others for Radio 4, all the reunions about this, and, she, and he, he listened to it. And he said to me, just as I was going under, he said to me, were they good people in the room? And I was really, I was going, were they? <laughs> oh my God, I'm not sure. I mean, I was kind of struggling with this, and then the lights went out. And the lights are, the lights are still out, to your question. But, you know, I'm afraid, sorry about that. Well, we'll, we'll take one, one more. One quick, I'll, I'll be very quick. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so he was talking about um, having government in Dublin, uh, not in Northern Ireland at the time, in, in terms of his politics. Yeah. And was he kind of trying to get away from those seeds of division just after the war with Churchill? Because both of them were having a good tete a tete after the war and before the war. Well, I mean, I, I, I want to be very good the answer. I've written a book about Churchill and Ireland, which discusses. Those relations. So I want to say something, just one thing about the other era. The other era was in Time magazine at the time of the IRA campaign of 1956 in Northern Ireland. And he was said, well, you were in the IRA in 1990. He said, look, there'll be the democratic basis. There was an election result, which there was, which you can argue by interpreting, but you can interpret if you want to. It's the IRA thing. He said, we were, we were involved in a democratic Anglo Irish struggle. The reason why I'm completely down on this IRA campaign in 1956-57 in Northern Ireland is because it's inter-Irish. That's what he calls it. It's an inter-Irish conflict, and I'm not prepared to stand over a campaign which is going to be basically involved as the British IRA's campaign. And don't forget, they are responsible for 60% of the deaths, uh, uh, the lion's share of them. It was mainly about killing well, some people in British streets, but mainly about killing you know, other Irishmen who live not far from them. And Devere says then, this is not something I can ever counsel. And it is not an equivalent with the 1919-21 Anglo-Irish War I was part of. Right, I'm going to, to draw it to a close. Uh, um, I was tempted to well say that, that uh, it's not time for sound bites, but I feel the hand <laughs> of God on my shoulder. Uh, I know it was history for Tony Blair, but following the God questions, I think it's God telling us it's getting a bit too hot uh, yeah. in here. So yeah. I'd like, uh, I'd just of all, first like to remind you that there are refreshments available, alcoholic and non alcoholic. Uh, they're across, because there's nowhere nice to have that in this building, the refreshments are you just cross the road. Uh, to the glass building, the Wolfson Medical Building, and you'll find George there with some cool or warm drinks or whatever you like. But before uh, before you go, 
Uh, I'd just like you to join me in Thanks. thanking Paul for such a robust and interesting way of dealing with such a complex topic as Northern Ireland. And in return for that, here is a Royal Philosophical Society of Glasgow paperweight, and you can you can throw it. I I will. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.